Warren Buffett with Robert Miles. This is a timely program uh, in the wake of Buffett's longtime partner, Charlie Munger's passing. Mm. And this is still an announcement. We have a new program on April 18th. Uh, this is a webinar only, but a quick show of hands. Who loves Bravo Vale? Yeah, I figured. Uh, I'm sure you're all very excited to see La Boheme this summer at the Philadelphia Orchestra. We're doing a program on April 18th with our friends at Bravo, with the woman who will sing the role of Musetta and the man who wrote the book on Puccini. And this is a program introducing you to a new perspective that will deepen your understanding of this iconic opera. That's on April 18th and we'll close out our winter season. Uh, before we introduce tonight's program, I have a few things to share. First, please silence or turn off your cell phones. And that goes for you at home as well. We don't need any interruptions. <laughs> Uh, this program will run until eight o'clock. There will be ample opportunity for questions. And as you'll see, you'll have ample uh, resources for answers up here as well. Now to introduce this program and our moderator, please welcome to the stage, our board chair and the visionary of the Conversations on Controversial Issues series, Dale Mosier. Thank you, James, and welcome everybody. It's a great honor uh, to be able to present this, which is our eighth program in this series of conversations on controversial issues. You may have wondered if there are actually eight controversial issues. Well, we've been discussing this a little bit this week, and we've figured out that there are they there are an endless number of controversial issues that we will be able to include in this series. So uh, have no fears, but this is our eighth one and it has, we've been very pleased with uh, all of the sessions. And I certainly like to compliment Clay. He's been a delight to work with, but also he is such a scholar and so capable of doing what he does, both in the uh, controversial series, as well as the, uh, side programs that he does every uh, time that he is here. So I'm not going to introduce Clay very much because you've all heard that uh, in the past. I will spend a little bit of time uh, with uh, Professor Brady. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to have Professor Brady. Uh, and he's the uh, Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at uh, UC Berkeley. And having done that, uh, for some time, he also had the prestigious honor of becoming president of the American uh, uh, Society for Political Science. Uh, he's a, also a fellow of the American Society of Arts and Sciences, uh, designated in 2003, a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science in 2006. And he, he was the dean of the prestigious School of Public Policy at Berkeley for 12 years. And in that uh, position, brought in so many very strong people uh, at the government level and other levels. And I'm expecting that we'll have an opportunity uh, to take advantage of uh, his connections for future speakers. And so we very much appreciate that. Uh, he's co-editor of the Daedalus uh, collection of... Uh, for the uh, institutions and experts in the loss of trust, which was pulled together in the fall of 2002. And we do have books, uh, some books, uh, not for everybody, but for everybody who wants one, I think we will have enough of these books. And uh, uh, Professor Brady and a cohort uh, pulled this together and it's a phenomenal intellectual compendium of different, articles, different points of view relative to the loss of trust of the uh, institutions. So uh, he'll be available after the program at the uh, at the back of the room to sign that and provide those to you. So without uh, further ado, Clay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, we're so glad you're here. There are people that are joining us on a streaming service, and we hope that they will uh, send in their questions, and if they come 
Uh, we'll, um, of course, bring those to uh, Professor Brady's attention, too. Um, some of my good friends are here from the online courses that I teach. Uh, this is the largest gathering of them so far. Um, it's wonderful to see them. Uh, so thank you for being here. I do online courses. You can go to our website, ltamerica.org. I also lead cultural tours on the Lewis and Clark Trail and to Literary England coming in September. We went to Greece last summer uh, and we'll be going to France again uh, the year after this one. And we I have this handout for LT America. If you linger, I'd be happy to give that to you. Um, but I'll be beginning around May 1st. I'm going to retrace John Steinbeck's entire Travels with Charlie tour from 1960 in an Airstream. And so uh, it's coming fast now. And I've been making packing lists and you know how all that goes. And so I couldn't be more excited. And I'll be reporting back uh, through our site, ltamerica.org, on how the mood of the country feels as we approach our 250th birthday. So do take one of these away if you would like. I want to also introduce my manager, Beth Kaler. If you just raise your hand. She's from Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, she has... I spin a lot of plates in my life, and she's the one who um, picks up all the pieces on the ground <laughs> after they fall. So thank you. I'm glad that you're here, Beth. All right. So I won't call you Dr. Brady. I'll call you Professor. But I promise I won't call you. I might call you Henry. That's fine. But I won't call you Hank. <laughs> That's okay. You know, H.L. Mencken, one of my favorite authors, said that the, that, uh, the first Rotarian was the first person who called Jesus Jack. <laughs> so I, if, if I may, I'll call you Henry. Thank you, Smart. So disillusionment, loss of trust in American institutions. Let me just set the table here for a moment. These are just picked more or less at random. Did you see the news about the Oklahoma judge who was presiding over a murder trial recently and she texted 500 texts beneath the table while this was going on. And they weren't about the case, thank goodness, but they were about the, the clothing of the attorneys and the, the, the deportment of their hairstyles. She resigned, of course. I think that one will be uh, a mistrial. TMI. TMI. TMI information. Uh, think of Lance Armstrong or Sammy Sosa yeah. or, from your part of the world, Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds. Think of the chaotic American withdrawal from Afghanistan, one of the most shameful military events after 20 years and not that much gained. Think of two members of the United States Senate on the evening before we closed down the economy over COVID, working their stock portfolios, knowing that the economy was about to collapse and they took advantage, and neither of them was punished by the Ethics Committee in the United States Senate. Think of the ongoing agony of the Catholic Church and its not only its sexual scandals, but cover-ups of those scandals. Think of an FBI director intervening not once but twice in the 2016 election, clearly having some, let's say, impact on that election. Or think of two recent university presidents, one in your area, Stanford, one at Harvard, both losing their jobs, one for misrepresenting scientific research and the other for plagiarism, although it was a relatively low-level plagiarism. Think of the Supreme Court mm -hmm. of the United States, the things that we're learning, you know, the kind of emoluments that these some of these justices are taking from very rich people would look from Mars or Jupiter like bribery. Mm -hmm. These are int uh, individuals who had cases pending before the Supreme Court of the United States. Think of Jerry Falwell Jr. at Liberty University. You've heard this one, you know, um, the, the love triangle with the pool boy. It's always a pool boy. And, uh, and this is the institution that, that prides itself greatly on family values. Or right here in Colorado, Ted Haggard, uh, who was also um, implicated with... Um, cocaine, meth, and mm -hmm. the inevitable pool boy. Think of how every month or so now, Henry, we have an announcement on the news that we are about to avert a government shutdown, by which we mean we're going to pay our bills for funds already appropriated and spent. Or think of Jeffrey Epstein and his friends, among them Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, 
of all people, Alan Dershowitz, mm -hmm. um, and of course, poor Prince Andrew. And I don't even want to bring up Kate Middleton and the photo stuff. Yeah. Think of um, the university admissions scandal of a couple of years ago. Felicity Huffman among the celebrities. Uh, Lori, of course, Laughlin. Becky was corrupt. Think of a U.S. senator from Maryland who has gold ingots in his closet. Gold ingots. Uh, think of the children of recent presidents engaged in what can only be called influence peddling in their foreign investments. Mm -hmm. Think of a policeman in Minneapolis with his knee on a black man's neck for nine minutes while that man begged to see his mother. And then, of course, think of George Santos, the winner of, <laughs> the winner of that lottery. You know, Henry, Mark Twain... I mentioned Congress. The Congress is always at the lowest ebb of American trust. And Mark Twain said two marvelous things about Congress. He said, first of all, he said, suppose you are an idiot, and then suppose you are a member of Congress. But I repeat myself. <laughs> and, and he said it could probably be shown by facts and figures that America has no distinctive criminal class except Congress. <laughs> Yeah. So you you take my point. There is good reason to be disillusioned. Right. One reason institutions are not trusted is because they're not trustworthy. And uh, institutions need to be trustworthy in order to be trusted. I'm concerned, however, that it, it's gone beyond that. I mean, certainly there's ample evidence in our volume. Again, just to show you. 2022. Hey, you missed this. 2022. Uh, so it's it's very recent. Um we have lots of evidence about the tr untrustworthiness of institutions, but I'm concerned that it seems to have gone to a new level. There's been tremendous decline in trust in every institution except one, the military, and the other one is small business, actually. Um, big business trust has gone down. Labor trust has gone down. Religion, you name it. Uh, uh, medicine, uh, journalism, higher education, uh, and so on and so forth. Do we have a list up there? Yeah, okay. Um, and so, yes, they've all gone down, except for the military. And beyond that, though, the thing that really concerns me is the polarization in trust. It used to be that the level of trust was the same between Republicans and Democrats. And so, yeah, if an institution was distrusted, Democrats distrusted it, Republicans distrusted it. Or if it was trusted, both partisan groups trusted it. Now it's a situation where for most groups, there's one group that trusts it and another group that distrusts it. So for the military, police, religion, and big business, Republicans trust those institutions, Democrats do not. For labor, journalism, higher education, science, and a bunch of others, it's Democrats who trust them. So we have this bifurcation, uh, this polarization, this this difference in levels of trust between the partisan groups. And the trouble with that is what's going on? If the institution is untrustworthy, then the two groups should see it in the same way. So something more is going on. And what seems to be happening is there's just a belief on the part of people of one party that a set of groups are the groups that should be trusted, and another party thinks there's another group. And by the way, one of the reasons for this appears to be that there's been a growing homogeneity of some of these groups. Uh, it used to be that there was a lot of people, for example, in Congress who uh, were liberal Democrats and who were also uh, conservative Democrats. And there was conservative Republicans, but there were also some liberal Republicans. And so institutions, even the parties overlapped in terms of liberal conservative. That's not happening anymore with respect to the parties but even more so, it's not happening with respect to some of these institutions. Higher education is increasingly democratic. Police are increasingly Republican. Religion, especially evangelical Christianity, is increasingly Republican. It's a little more complicated in religion, but the most notable, the ones that really get the most press are the evangelical Christians, white evangelical Christians, to be precise. Um, and they are increasingly highly Republican. So something's happening in our society where people are going to different corners and having different notions of which institutions can be trusted. And the bottom line for this is, how can we reform some of these institutions, which badly need reformation? Uh, police, police are not perfect. 
uh, they need reformation. But if one side says defund the police, get rid of them, and the other side says, no, no, they're doing a great job, give them even more money, it's very hard to figure out where you can meet in the middle and make decisions about how to change that institution. And I'll talk a little bit about how there are some ways to do it. And I'll just give you, to give you a hint, we have people at Berkeley who are working with the Oakland community mm -hmm. to discuss not the things of, are the police too violent or are the police uh, just doing a great job and stopping crime, asking instead, how do you define safety and getting groups together to discuss safety, what it means to feel safe, and that allows Republicans and Democrats to talk about what they like and dislike about police. Because it turns out that many, especially in minority communities, are actually quite happy to have police there because they can make them feel safe. But they do wish that the police didn't sometimes target uh, their members of their group and so forth. So by discussing safety and making that the paramount point of discussion, some progress seems to be being made. So I hear you saying that there's been the politicization and the polarization of trust and that's, distrust. That's what's really you know, there used to be pro-life Democrats and pro-choice Republicans. Now that's almost an ironclad litmus test right. between the two parties. And that erosion of the of the spectrum of political views within party is one reason that we're in this right. sort of paralysis, right? Yeah. It, there's been the big sort which is the two parties now are sorted out ideologically so that Republicans are conservative and Democrats are liberal. And there's not the other type uh, in each party like there used to be. And you've probably been watching also that we're now sorting geographically, that people right. are moving to Texas from California right. or from Alabama right. to Massachusetts to be with right. their tribe. With fellow partisans. Yeah. And this is worrisome because this is not an America that will stay together. Now, on the other hand, there's actually a lot of things we agree upon, and there's probably an overemphasis upon the ways we're different, partly because of the 24-hour news cycle, cable news, now social media. And there's this tremendous emphasis upon how we're so different, because MSNBC tells you one story, and Fox News tells you another story. And as a result, people get in bubbles and believe that the story that the group that they're, the, the media they're looking at is the total complete story when it's really only part of the story. Uh, my wife and I watch actually Fox News and MSNBC and CNN and lots of other things as well. And we're always amazed at how different the pictures are that you see of America. And I really would recommend, even though it may be hard, some of you may find it difficult to watch the other channel, uh, but you should try it because it really could change your perspective. And at least it might cause you to say, wait a minute, why are they focused so on that? Like immigration, for example, Fox for a long time was focused on that and they were probably right to be focused upon that. And MSNBC wasn't talking much about that. Uh, on the other hand, Fox talks all the time about Hunter Biden and looks like that's coming to a dismal end. The, this is the impeachment attempt based upon Hunter Biden's behavior. And at least judging from today's uh, hearing, it, it's, it's not going anyplace. Just a quick comment about this, this graphic. Uh, this is uh, the change over the last, say, 18 months in right. trust. And so you can see it's down for almost everything. And a yeah, little no, bit oh, down. This is actually over the last 50 years, just to be exact. No, this is the last year. But if, oh, okay, but if, this is the last year. Oh, but Henry, if you look back, that's, yeah, what, that's the point I want to make. If you go oh, back okay. to 1960, there was a great deal of trust in the oh, presidency, wow. in Congress, in the media, in churches, in the courts. And since the 1960s, there's been this plummet. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. So if you right. would go um, to... Slide eight, please, James. So it, maybe it's transparency, right? We just know so much right. more now about the Supreme Court. When I was growing up, the Supreme Court was nine people. Then they were all males in black robes. You didn't really know much about them. You just mm -hmm. assumed they were eminent jurists who were not involved in the human condition at all, who just were trying to make the right decisions with right. respect to the Constitution. Now we know so much about their lives. And maybe they were no better then than they are now, but we didn't know it. So what's the possibility of transparency being one of the triggers here? No, I think it is. And also the news media becoming more critical, uh, especially post Watergate. There's just no question. One of the essays in our uh, volume is uh, by a noted critic of journalism. And he talks about how, in fact, post Watergate, 
journalism is much more critical of institutions. Uh, it used to be that, in fact, it pretty much took the press releases from government and reproduced them with maybe a little change in wording, but that doesn't happen anymore. And so you get these very critical articles. Uh, and uh, as a result, we're more critical. The other thing he points out, interestingly, is there's more college educated people in America. And one of the things we do, and we're sort of proud of this at universities, is we make people more skeptical. It, I fear that we've also made them more cynical. And I wish that hadn't happened. Um, but we certainly make them skeptics and questioners of institutions. That's probably a good thing. But in the end, we have to have some belief in some institutions. Otherwise, how, how can we solve problems unless we believe that we're getting good information and good behavior from those institutions? You, you mentioned Watergate 1974, the right. resignation of Richard Nixon, first president in American history to resign of it's kind of a watershed moment. Then you have the debacle of Vietnam right. with the helicopter on the top of the uh, embassy in Saigon. Then you have the church committee right. investigating America's secret services and national security entities helping in assassinating um, uh, heads of state in other countries. That was a period of deep, sudden disillusionment, right. wasn't it? Well, uh, let me tell a quick story. Uh, I was naive. In 1972, uh, right after a, uh, there was a burglary at the Watergate, I had friends. I was in Washington, D.C. I had friends at the Committee for the Re-election of the President. I was going to lunch with them one day. And this is two or three days after the burglary. And I met with them and they said, you know, we can't understand it. Jeb Magruder got really mad at us because we put up a sign that said, free the Watergate 7. You may remember that it was the Chicago 8, then 7 at that period. So they were sort of trying to play off that and be funny. And they said, but Jeb Magruder came took that sign, ripped it down, ripped it up, and screamed at us to never do that again. And they said to me, do you think there's any connection between the Committee for the Re-Election of the President and the Watergate burglary? And I said, future political scientist, I can't imagine. People just get nervous around campaigns. I'm sure there's nothing going on. It's a third a third rate burglary, we so, were told. Right. And so that's why I became a political scientist, since obviously you don't want me in the political sphere actually doing anything. The committee for the re-election of the president, acronym creep. Creep. What what could go wrong, right? Right. So I mean, I I I was presented with evidence that if you think about it now, you go, oh my gosh, that's Woodward Bernstein kind of evidence that if I'd been smart enough, I could have scooped him. But I just passed it off as and that's because I trusted institutions. I trusted institutions. I believe that well, they couldn't be doing that kind of thing. They were. Well, just a couple of things. You know, 1963, the assassination of John Kennedy, almost from the beginning of the Warren Commission publishing its report, a very substantial proportion of American people said, no, that can't be right. right. They just didn't want to accept that as the narrative. I think they were right, by the way. Then in 1968, you have the debacle, the, the assassinations of Martin Luther King of Robert Kennedy, the, the incredible uh, chaos of the Democratic National yeah. Convention in Chicago, the Tet Offensive, Walter Cronkite saying it's over. Right, uh, the, the, the Czech Spring. So that that was a rough period from 1968, let's say, to 1978 right. of, of good reason to plummet trust, right? Right. Yeah, no, and Vietnam, of course, the way that ended with the helicopter on top of the embassy, uh, that is not something that's going to give you trust in institutions. Um, but it still is a problem that we don't have trust in these institutions, which are the ways the institutions that day by day give us our information, uh, that give us our legal services and our medical services and so forth. And we need to do something to solve the problem of lack of trust. Uh, and we saw this very clearly with respect to police in the last few years. And we've seen it with respect to COVID, where the institutions that gave us our medical information were not trusted. Uh, now, I think they made mistakes, but nevertheless, the level of distrust to the level that some people did not get vaccinated and therefore died as a result of not trusting those institutions, that's really pretty awful. In about 15 minutes, we're going to pause so that you can ask your questions, and then there will be a longer question period at the end. But so let me ask this sort of philosophical question. When this happens, when trust has reached mm -hmm. this low level, Congress at 13%, right. you know, the, the Supreme Court at 27%. And there's some, some of these are temporary and they, they come and go, but a lot of them are still trending down. Yeah. 
when a nation's basic institutions, the church, the media, the, the, its, its uh, political institutions, its higher education or public education, when there's so much widespread public skepticism and distrust of these things, how does a nation operate when it doesn't have a modicum, let's say a majority of basic trust? I think it's hard. And I, I, I mean, part of what I'm trying to think about it, and towards the end of this, we're going to give, my, give us I, my David Letterman 10, 10 ideas list um, to, uh, of things we can do. I mean, part of what we've got to do is make sure that our politics isn't as uh, uh, bitter as it is, because I think that's part of the beginning of it and an inability to sort of listen to the other side. Uh, but we also have to, as human beings, start trusting one another a little bit more. But that probably means finding venues and methods by which we get together and we actually talk to people. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not sure that social media are le is leading to that. I think it's leading to people, you know, doing this. Uh, and not our judges under the table doing whatever she was doing. Um, 500 texts on a murder trial. Yeah, in a murder trial. Boy, yes. Um, and so we just have to find new mechanisms for doing that. And, and that means thinking hard about our institutions uh, and about, uh, and that means both political institutions and non-political institutions. And then finally, just about us as a people and what we will do and how we will try to interact with one another. Let's go to uh, 23, James. I want to play a little uh, video clip. One of the things we do here at the Vail Symposium is we have the opportunity, uh, yes, we have the opportunity to, to interview a number of people before they come here, or if they can't come, we have the joy of, of a little piece of video. This is a retired Major General Mary Kay Eder, and we had a really fascinating interview with her. She's in the greater Washington area. And this is what she said about decline of trust. Oops. Uh, volume. It's in our institutions, not just in America, but globally, for about 20 years. I follow the Edelman Trust Barometer, which comes out every year, just about the time they have that conference in Davos in February. So every year, Edelman, global communications firm, comes out with its state of global institutions and democracies, government, media, non-government organizations, and business. So it's been slowly declining with trust in all institutions over the past 20 years. I think last year was pretty much rock bottom in the 2023 summary. So what is, what is new in 2024? So I've been looking at the latest iteration of this, and I think the biggest change to me is the comment that this year, most people feel, and they, they survey 30 some countries, but most people feel that society is changing too fast. So I think where we are now is haves and have nots. And if you talk about being a historian, certainly I think that, well, studying history lets you know that things weren't great then either. So, Henry, you know, one way to kind of analyze the rage and reactivity of our time is that we've had so much social and technological change so fast over the past quarter century. You know, think of Barack Obama saying that he wasn't prepared to respect gay marriage, and suddenly there was a turnaround. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court makes its decision. Uh, most people didn't think about transgender 15 or 20 years ago. Now it's one of the central themes of American life. Uh, millions of good Americans, good and decent Americans, feel that the change has come so hard, so fast, that they're overwhelmed both technologically and culturally, and that they want to get off this train right. and then maybe come along politicians and say, I can fix that. Uh, don't you think that the pace of change is one of the drivers of this? Absolutely. I mean, just think of this thing, and and I would not, I'd be nervous about raising kids today. Uh, luckily, ours were raised uh, in an era where the computers were here, but it wasn't the internet the way it is today. And it certainly was not the iPhone, but the chance for a, a child to be bullied, uh, all the noxious and awful stuff that occurs uh, on social media, 
is really worrisome. There's a book by a uh, Rutgers historian, Beth Rabinowitz, called Defensive Nationalism. And she makes a comparison between 1860 to 1920 and the current period, which is, she claims, rough, roughly 1960 to uh, 2020. She says, in that earlier period, there was tremendous technological change. This was the, the telegraph, the telephone, uh, and electricity, and of course, steam. Motion pictures, and also radio. Motion pictures and radio, and also uh, new modes of transportation, um, cars, and, and so on and so forth. And she said it was, in her view, too fast. And it led to many nations having populations that were terrified of what the future was going to hold. And as a result, they engaged in what she calls defensive nationalism. And we see that now, uh, saying turning inward, saying we're not going to think about the world out there because it's just too much. Uh, I'm not sure that's enough to just turn inward. I think we have to actually think harder about things. And now we've got AI. I've been going to conferences at Berkeley. Uh, I'm a statistician by training, uh, ec econometrician, actually. And I know a lot about what's inside AI, but it still scares the heck out of me. Um, even though it, really what it is, is it's, it's a guessing machine and it's a really good guesser, but it seems to have come to a new level of ability of guessing that none of us, none of us really expected it would get to so quickly. And so there's a lot of interest in what's going on here with AI, but whatever's going on, it's a powerful, powerful method. And it's going to really change the world. And given the debacle, I think we had with social media, well, remember, we thought this would be just great and everything would be good. Uh, from a political scientist perspective, I was told by people in Silicon Valley how everybody now could participate in politics and it would just increase everybody's ability to be heard. Unfortunately, what it's done is it's actually mobilized a lot of the people that Hamilton said would never be mobilized in a large republic because they would be too far apart and they would be not able to get together. And these were the extreme elements in the society. And he really thought a large republic would be protected by the fact that extreme elements could not easily get together. He had not anticipated the internet. And so as a result, uh, we have situations now where the world is just changing too fast. So you see the slide on social media. I just want to ask you a follow-up question about that. So we all get it. And and one of the, the ways that people um, try to explain where we are is always social media, social media, social media that it's changed everything and it, it's allowed everyone to publish and without peer review and so on. You do metrics. How, how do you figure out how to give the proper weight to social media for the very disillusionment we're talking about? You mean the degree to which it's caused our problems? Or exacerbated them? Yeah, I think it's exacerbated. I mean, we did at Berkeley, uh, I, have, I had a, when I was dean, a, an institute that looked at the problems of young Americans, and we did a study of stress and anxiety, and it's really on the increase among young people. And we tried to figure out whether this was artifactual or whether it was real. And we came to the conclusion uh, that it was real and that there's something really going on. And then we started saying, well, what's causing this? Well, one of the correlates seems to be social media. Now, I don't think we've proven that's true yet, but there's evidence is growing that social media makes you anxious. I mean, how could it not? I mean, you're sitting there and suddenly somebody texts you or I'm, you know, TikToks you or Post something. I'm, I'm, I'm behind on the technologies. Um, but anyway, send you pictures of awful things that have just happened in Gaza, for example, you know, really horrific pictures. Things that maybe we wouldn't even see. You're doing photographs tomorrow, and there's a famous photograph that Clay's going to talk about that came out during the time of Vietnam. But we didn't see those on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. You only saw them once because they right. came and went in the newspapers, right. right? And now we see them, for some young people, it's just a constant barrage. And how can that not make you pretty crazy? Indeed. So uh, let's go to uh, just to, to nine for a moment. I want to bring a little history into this, if we can, Henry. So we've always been a restless, turbulent, skeptical, rebellious people. Uh, for example, Shays' Rebellion, mm -hmm. uh, which led to the creation of the Constitution in 1787. They were trying to make sure that didn't happen again. The Whiskey Rebellion, yes. which was 1794 and uh, was what you know have, was uh, was about unfair. Uh, forms of taxation in the Trans-Appalachian, Gabriel's Rebellion, the Slave Rebellion in Virginia in 1800, 
Then, of course, the wind up to the Civil War right. and the Civil War, vigilantism in the American West. We've always been a turbulent people. Now add prohibition with widespread, almost universal smuggling and lawlessness. Maybe the skepticism we have about institutions is part of the character of the American people. I, I think it is, and I think it can be good. But on the other hand, it, it can't go too far. I mean, if you get to the point where you just don't believe that any institution can deliver to you, um, I mean, after all, yes, we should be skeptical of government. Uh, we should be worried about government. But, but, but as my wife says, you know, you should be really skeptical and worried about government. Uh, it might pave a road right to your doorstep. <laughs> The point is, mm -hmm. there are good things government does, and you want actually a road probably to your doorstep in most instances. And so if we're so skeptical of it, we don't even want to pay the taxes to get the road built to our doorstep, uh, we're going to have a lot of infrastructure that we need that we don't have. And there's just a lot of indication that we've gotten to that point where people are so skeptical. Now, as a, a dean of a public policy school, my feeling was that one of the great challenges we had was to try to make government more effective and efficient and to tell that story. Because I don't think government is always effective and efficient. Uh, I can give you lots of examples of where it's not. We teach these to our students and we say, don't do these things. Um, and I can also tell you situations where our students have really made government so much more effective and efficient by bringing good data analysis, good policy analysis to bear on the topic and literally save the government millions, if not billions of dollars. You and I had a little conversation yesterday about this. So Americans want X number of services from their government. They want clean water. They want garbage uh, pickup. They want, you know, the whole business. And we're only willing to tax ourselves to about right. one half X. And then when the government services are not what we expect, then we blame them for not fulfilling right. that. But but a lot of it is is the differential between our, what we're willing to tax ourselves for and the, the expectations we have of government. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And that and that's exacerbated by extreme skepticism and so forth. So we, we have to somehow get a balance here and understand. And but, but it's partly the government's fault. We've got to do a better job of indicating to people the value they're getting for their money. We do a better job at this usually at local levels than we do at a national level. It's not clear. For example, right now, a big debate over Ukraine. Are we getting value for that? That's a complicated question, uh, and it's hard to see. Uh, I would argue that ultimately, probably we are, uh, but I can see people who would argue, no, we're not, um, and why they might make that argument. Uh, but we have to do a better job of explaining to people uh, why what we're doing makes sense. So before we take some questions here, we'll do that in just a minute. I want to ask you, you know, that long list of church and police and right. the military and so on. What are the ones that alarm you most? I mean, for example, I don't really lose any sleep over the lack of respect for Congress. I mean, that doesn't. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That doesn't really tri yeah, terribly yeah. bother, or the or the presidency for that matter. No. But the church does trouble me a great deal. What about the Supreme Court? Religion really worries me. Police really worries me. Uh, the Supreme Court really worries me. And for a long time, they were doing okay. They were going along. Uh, with the Dobbs decision, they seem to have really uh, changed. And Bush uh, v. Gore, 2000. Was and Bush v. Gore was a, probably the starting point of it, too. Um, and so there's a lot of distrust of, of the Supreme Court, and uh, and it's increasing. And I think that's really worrisome because the Supreme Court, they don't have a police force or a bureaucracy to implement their decisions. Basically, the implementation of their decisions based upon legitimacy, and they're losing legitimacy at a fierce rate. So I want to I want to stick with this, and I want to go back to my question about the implications of this. So maybe it's okay because the the garbage does tend to get picked up, right. and, and we do have a defense department, and we have a judiciary, and so on. And the politicization suggests that there's no easy fix to this because one side mm -hmm. believes the FBI can't do any wrong, and the other side believes mm -hmm. that it's now part of the deep state corruption of the country. But if you take the Supreme Court. They make monumental decisions about people's lives, and their only legitimacy comes from our trust that they are specially thoughtful, careful, constitutionally rigorous human beings. And when we discover they're people like other people, right. then how do we have how do we get behind the controversial decisions that they need to make on behalf of all of us? Well, they have to think about their legitimacy. I mean, I think right now is a very 
perilous time for them. They're going to have to decide how they're going to deal with some very tricky cases and do it in a way that they think is sort of legally correct, but also that doesn't lose them a lot more legitimacy. Uh, my guess is they may not think hard about that. One of the reasons is we've got a uh, Supreme Court filled with lawyers. Um, we don't have anybody on the Supreme Court who was once an elected official. And historically, we have had such people or people from who did other things in their lives and and were involved in activism of some sort or another. Well, Earl Warren was the governor of California. Yeah. Sandra Day O'Connor was an elected official. And she was always a moderate on the course who was trying to bring people together. And she knew what the folks out there were thinking, whereas I'm worried a lot of the folks on the Supreme Court right now, all they know is their legal textbooks and their legal ideologies. And I don't think that's a sufficient source of wisdom with respect to some of the issues that they're making decisions about. So do you have any sense of um, how this fits in the world situation? Do we know historically of other nations where this plummeting of trust has occurred and does it help to make them disintegrate or does it is it a period they go through and then they find a way to regenerate what do we know about this i i'm sort of thinking about the roman republic at the moment sure. when things start to spin out of control okay well i, I i'm not going to go there you the clay is clay is a humanist he knows about so many things and there are areas i'm not going to try to go to but i will say that rabinowitz in her book uh talking about the the uh, 1860 to 1920 uh, period points out that what happened at the end of that period, World War I, then World War II, and a lot of disintegration, actually disintegration of a whole bunch of empires, disintegration ultimately then of a lot of other countries, and the creation of really a pretty messy situation with the Soviet bloc and then the United States on the other side for the next 70 years or so. Uh, so that's worrisome. I don't think we want to go back to the period 1920 to 1990. It wasn't always the greatest period. Uh, and so I'm worried about where we're going, whether we're going to see disintegration in a lot of European countries. We, we seem to see some of that already uh, with some of those countries. Uh, and then maybe in the United States, in which case uh, already The Economist, uh, a noted journal, centrist uh, journal, British has, journal yeah. has changed their rating of America from democracy to flawed democracy. Freedom House, which is known as a right of center organization, has rated us 59th in the world. 59th. Argentina and Romania and places like that. And I want to cast dispersions on them, but frankly, it's not what we want to have as our bedfellows. Pretty soon we'll fall behind Albania. Yeah. Let's take some questions. Uh, maybe we have some from the streaming, but uh, let's take some questions. Raise your hand. They'll get a microphone to you. Um, and these can be any sorts of questions you please, but let's try to avoid using the T word. <laughs> yeah. Let's try to get through this evening without focusing on the T word. We do. And for those online, please put it on the chat or the Q&A. And in the interest of time, please also keep your questions to a question. And I am going to start with an online question. We have a number of online questions. Trust is based on a shared respect for the truth. How does an environment of alternative facts allow for trust? We have a faction in government dedicated to chaos and active destruction of trust. How will we get around that? So fake news, alternative facts. It's a tremendous problem that we face right now. When I give you my list of solutions, I think one thing we need is better civic education, which includes talking and teaching students, talking with them about how do you actually figure out if something's true. And there are places where they're doing this in K through 12 education, but we need to do even more of this so that people understand. We also need to teach them about how institutions police themselves. So that I, my guess is that most Americans don't know uh, when they think about higher education, that most of us professors live in fear of what we call the graduate student with our name on him or her. What do we mean by that? We mean the graduate student who looks at all of our life's work and says, ah, that idiot, I could do better than that. Let me show that that jerk got it all wrong. That's a mechanism we have in our higher education, in academia, that polices us. And so it's just not the case that we get off, get to go off and say whatever we want to say, 
we're constantly worried about those graduate students who are going to take us apart. And it happens periodically. Uh, and they point out that we just got it wrong. Um, and you, usually if you are generous in spirit, you say, well, that's great. Good for you. But sometimes it really hurts. But, <laughs> but the point is, there's a mechanism there that's not just letting people in higher education say anything they want, by and large. There's a mechanism which is policing them and forcing them to at least think about whether they got it right or got it wrong. So we, well, if we have time at the end, I'm going to ask you to tell that story that you told us about global climate change and a scientific right. challenge to that, but let's hold it for the moment. Sure. Per, per alternative facts and fake news, I think I can announce that sometime in the next year, we're going to have here in Vail a conversation with the extraordinary uh, University of Colorado scholar, Patricia Limerick, Patty Limerick, and she wants to do a program on how um, George Orwell's 1984 is holding up. Uh, you know, <laughs> and I just reread it, and um, he's you know he's he's very wrong headed about technology right. because it's so much worse technologically right, now. Right, right. But we're going to do this program where she's going to be Patty Limerick. You probably know her. She's one of the most extraordinary scholars in the country, and she wanted me to be George Orwell because <laughs> you know I do these characters. I said no, I'm not doing that. But I said I will be 1984, <laughs> and so I'll come out. In a book jacket. Okay. And she's we're gonna have this conversation. You should come. So Orwell didn't end that well, so be careful. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm not gonna ask you what your room 101 is, my friend, but but mine is not rats in a cage. Right, right. Although it's right up there. Thank you both for being here. Clay, you had mentioned that your issue with Congress is not such a big deal and you're more concerned with church and so forth. Well, I agree with that. I, I think the issue with the Supreme Court is even more concerning. But what concerns me is the polarization in this country and how do you get away, how you do away with it? Because these political parties vote the party no matter what it is. If you have a mass shooting in an elementary school, one side's going to take prayer, and the other guys are going to try and change the MRA or, or the legislation, and so on and so forth. Those things go on, and it continues, even with what's going on with the coming presidential election. There's so much issues, and I believe these Congress people are brought up there, and they're probably very smart to know the difference of what's right and wrong in representing the country, but yet they continue to take the sides of their party irrespectively. And I don't know how you get a, get around that. It's a difficult problem. So let me just talk a little bit about sort of Thomas Jefferson on, on this theme. So we were a republic, and a republic is a very fragile, mm -hmm. difficult form of government. They don't tend to last very long. And the founding fathers were quite aware of this. And so they built in as many guardrails as they possibly could. But we're not only in late capitalism, but we're in late republicanism, small r republicanism. And it may be that there's so much money awash in our culture and the media has become so incredibly powerful that this makes inevitable some of this polarization. So remember, those of you who are older than 60, when there were just three networks in the country and when something happened everyone would tune in to hear what eric severide was going to say about it on the cbs evening news this was when we had a fairness doctrine this is when uh, the fcc monitored what happened on the airwaves because of course they were public airwaves with the rise of cable and particularly siloed cable all bets are off aren't they henry yeah i i also though think that um uh, i was mentioning to clay yesterday that the McGovern Fraser Commission, which probably nobody here has ever heard of, but that was the group that was set up after the Democratic Convention of 68, which was such a disaster in so many ways. Um, and the Democrats decided they needed to reform their nomination process and get away from conventions, which were party insiders, and that was evil and so forth. And we ended up, and this was George McGovern, was one of the members of the commission, uh, with the primary system that we have now. The problem with the primary system uh, in that we have is that people on the left are worried about having a candidate who's going to be further to their left. And this is called being primaried. Uh, and people on the right are concerned about having people further to their right. 
And so there's an incentive structure built in to keep going more and more to extremes because that's the way you're going to get the nomination of your party. So I think we need new institutions. Like in California, we have a thing called the top two primary. We basically have the primaries collapsed between the parties. Everybody can vote in one primary. And there's a bunch of candidates, Republicans, Democrats, Greens, whatever. And then the candidates who get the top, the top two vote-getting candidates are the candidates who go forward. Now, that sometimes means you get two Democrats, sometimes means you get two Republicans, sometimes one of each. But the important thing is you are more likely to get a centrist candidate. With this California system. With this top two system. So I think we start need to start thinking of incentive systems. Those people in Congress who are going to the corners are only responding to the incentives they have to get reelected. And also, by the way, to either appear on MSNBC or Fox News, because that if they are extreme, they're going to appear on that, especially if they look angry. Uh, and in fact, that's part of the whole methodology of modern cable news and certainly social media, get people angry and then you'll get more clicks and you'll get more attention. And we've just got to find ways to change that incentive structure. I wouldn't mind a fairness doctrine coming back, by the way. I don't think it's coming back. but I don't know how we could do that. Uh, departed under the Reagan administration. And, and, yeah. and of course, cable has made that almost impossible almost, yeah. to police. And then there's Citizens United, basically allowing unlimited amounts of money and so on in our politics. Well, that's another thing I think we have to think about is that uh, Chief Justice Roberts was just simply wrong in his opinion when he said that he, he thought that uh, transparency would make it all just fine. And the fact is with super PACs, we don't have transparency. So we have a large amounts of money that's coming in anonymously into politics and having a big impact. And furthermore, the super PACs can, are not supposed to coordinate with political campaigns, but wink, wink, they do it all the time. And so the net result is uh, we, we've really not found through transparency the cleansing agent that would make sure that money wasn't going to create havoc. I think money has created havoc, and we've got to feel, find ways to solve that problem. Maybe a constitutional amendment. I think maybe a constitutional convention. You know, we're, we're an empire pretending it's a republic, and mm -hmm. there are strains that come when that happens mm -hmm. historically. And when you think about the, the way that campaigning works now, if I'm a member of Congress, say, on the far left or the far right, if I say the most outrageous thing I can possibly say my team is already planning a fundraising memo that night, right. and it works every time. Right. Right. So that there's an incentive to stir up extremism right. because it pays in campaign donations. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Going back to online, the institution we thought beyond compromise is the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> now justices are vetted for their political views. How can we recover from this in the institution that was our ultimate protection? So, Dr. Brady, uh, Professor Brady, how can the Supreme Court, and I'm sure John Roberts is working on this every day, right. how can the Supreme Court gain new legitimacy? Yeah, no, I mean, I think Chief Justice Roberts does care about the legitimacy of the yes. court. I really do. Uh, I'm not sure that some of the other members of the court do, but I, I really do believe he does. Um, how can we solve that problem? I'm not sure. Again, changing the incentives in our politics so we get more centrists might help in the nomination process. The other thing is, is I think it's a no-brainer that we need 18-year terms for the Supreme Court. It's just a no-brainer. I mean, that's a long time. Uh, somebody can have a real impact on the court in that period of time. So it's not too little time to have something done. Uh, but on the other hand, there's probably a limit to how long you should be there. And it should be a date certain so that everybody knows that. Um, and so that we don't have some of the peculiarities that occur right now with people deciding that they're going to retire based upon when the president comes into office, who they think will nominate a successor who will have the same ideological perspective they have. We shouldn't have that. How about another no-brainer? How about an actual policy of conflict of interest on the Supreme Court well, of the United States? <laughs> you know, I mean, you would think that that would be obvious. Right. It, it's embarrassing. I mean, the only thing you can possibly say is, I mean, my favorite is Chief Justice Alito saying that the seat that he got for free on this private plane would have otherwise been unfilled, caused me to immediately call up United Airlines and say, you know, I know there's a lot of empty seats on your flights, and uh, I'm sure that you would allow me to have one of them, because otherwise it would just be empty. But, you know, somehow they didn't see the argument there. They, the logic was missing for them. 
Chief Justice Roberts is an institutionalist, and I feel certain that he yeah. is worried about the future of the right. court because its capacity to to lead us through difficult times depends upon our belief that they're trying to do the right thing and that they're right. basically good human beings. And I don't think many Americans feel that strongly of this today. And so I think he's worried that the court is now being perceived as the third political branch of the government when that was what the founding fathers did not want. No, absolutely. And as to life tenure, you know, in Jefferson's time, uh, the average age was about 50. Right. So you get appointed and you live five years. Right. Now, if you get appointed when you're 40, you're going to live 60 years. Yes, exactly. More questions? Yeah, just a simple one, perhaps. <laughs> the uh, sorting of America. I'm curious what you think about sorting. You know, people moving to different states because they just don't agree with uh, local. I mean, if you take the trend line, and I think you've commented about your republics breaking down. Just your thoughts on the the geographic sorting of America. Is. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'll tell you what really worries me about that is that. To the degree that many of those people are maybe going to states with smaller populations, um, so I don't want to pick on North Dakota. Please, no, please, North, no, Dakota, please but North Dakota does not have a large population, but it's got two senators. Uh, California has got forty million people and has two senators. Um, I once hosted a, a discussion of uh, social welfare policy in. Um, the Western states, and I had people from every Western state, and I started with, you know, we have 700,000 people on welfare in California and Washington state, 300,000. And then we got to the person from Montana and they said, we have 300 people on welfare in Montana. And I, for a minute, I'm going 300, what? 300,000, what, what's going on? And she said, and I know them all. And I thought to myself, and they've got two senators. I mean, I think we are really moving towards a real constitutional crisis because there's calculations that show that within the next 20 or 30 years, something like 30% of the population could control two thirds of the seats in the Senate. And as a result, have a tremendous impact on American public policy, which does not seem proportional to their numbers. And it doesn't work towards compromise. It doesn't work towards so compromise. the founding fathers wanted a majoritarian system but the Senate, with its cloture rule, requires a supermajority to pass most legislation. Right. That's not constitutional. That's just a norm, and it damages us, particularly, as you say, Wyoming with half a million people, North Dakota 780,000 people, Alaska with under mm -hmm. half a million people. They each get two senators. So a senator in North Dakota is about 40 times more powerful, theoretically, right. than one of the two California senators. Exactly right. And most advanced industrial societies have either gotten rid of their upper house or they've made, or they've made it sort of not that important, uh, or they've made it more proportional. But the question was, what about people geographically finding their? Well, that's what I'm saying is that may exacerbate that problem. So we're in North Dakota. We're kind of hoping for some of that, you know, yeah. you know because we're down, you know, seven sixty, right. seven eighty. Right. right. Send us some of your California. So, yes. You know. Well, they're leaving. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure to North Dakota, by the way, no. but uh, nevertheless, and uh, probably Colorado, they probably are coming here. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's a worrisome thing that we're having this kind of uh, go to your opposite corners. Again, I, I don't know how to stop that, but certainly we don't want to pass a law that says you can't move. Um, and uh, that that's there are countries for which you can't unless you uh, meet certain legal requirements, but we just certainly don't want that. It's one of the basic rights we have as Americans, and it's one of the important ones. Um, but David French has a recent book about this, in which he talks about this sorting right. and says, we're just going to have to deal with it. Right. Because people are going to go to Texas out of California, and they're right. going to go to Maine from uh, Mississippi, and that they have every right to do so. And that, uh, that the dream of uh, an America that somehow wants to compromise and get along in the center is probably no longer in the cards, and we're just going to have to accept that. I guess I don't agree with that. I'm still hoping that somehow we can find ways to make the center the center and we can bring people to that center. And the, there are mechanisms like top two primaries. Um, well, fixing that, the gerrymandering problem. Well, actually, in fixing the gerrymandering problem, the trouble with that is it's not enough. Um, so, for example, Massachusetts has, uh, I think the number is nine members of Congress, and uh, they're all Democrats. And that's... Yet a third of the population of, of uh, Massachusetts is Republican. 
So something's wrong there. Now you might think, well, that's gerrymandering. It turns out people who are have supercomputers, literally, have taken them and tried to say, well, is there any way to come up with districts that would give Republicans at least one district? Turns out it's essentially impossible given where the Republicans live, where the Democrats live, and so forth, because they're intermingled with the, the Democrats. And so therefore, you can't create a district that's a Republican district. What you could do is go to multi-person, multi-candidate districts, and then have proportional representation. Now, you might say, well, that's un-American. We've never done that. Well, the truth is we did do it. There were kind of states in the West in the 19th century which had multi-member districts for Congress, and then the top two or three or whatever number of districts they had, or members of Congress they had, the top three candidates, for example, got to go to Congress uh, because they were the top three vote getters. If you, in fact, do multi-member districts and then you add to it um, ranked choice voting so you can actually see what people's second choices are and so you get a really pretty fair version as candidates are eliminated of what people's second and third choices are i think we could do a lot more to get something that looked more centrist and ranked more, choice uh, alaska and maine and, are and more truly representative alaska and maine are both experimenting with ranked choice yes. we'll do one more question at this point and then we'll go back to uh and you'll have plenty of time for questions in about 20 minutes <laughs> back to online Taking the example of the role of PBS NewsHour, for 40 plus years, I trusted it to present both sides of issues and watched it every evening. About five years ago, the NewsHour started embracing progressive orthodoxy and ignoring contrary views, and I stopped watching it. it the NewsHour did and could again serve a unique role as a nonprofit source of news, or could it? Is it still possible to have a news media be in that kind of unique nonprofit role? So some changes in NPR yeah, and, and yeah. P PBS. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I still watch it and find it to be better than almost any other source of giving you different perspectives because they actually bring in people from different points of view. So I, I actually think it's still pretty good. CNN, by the way, is trying very hard to be the centrist of the three major cable networks. They've moved a little back towards the center. Yes. And um, we'll see how that works out. I mean, the trouble is it does not seem to be a business model. Uh, because what gets people to watch is when they're constantly having their prejudices, pardon the phrase, uh, reinforced. And so, again, my wife and I fight against that. And we watch uh, Fox News, which uh, we're liberal Democrats, but we watch Fox News because, as I tell my students, I said, you know what? It's not just Democrats who have good ideas. Republicans have good ideas as well. And then they say, oh, and, I say, and then I give them some examples. And I say, here's some great ideas Democrats had. Public housing, for example. Multi-story public housing where you concentrate uh, poor people all in one area without amenities and so forth. That's a bad idea. That was a terrible idea. Most of those projects, thank God, have been now dynamited, certainly in Chicago. Uh, but, you know, that was a Democratic idea that was a pretty bad idea. There may be some problems with PBS and NPR, but one of the things that distinguishes them uh, is that there's some congressional oversight, so they have to be really careful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's on the whole worked well. And also, you know, the average soundbite on commercial uh, media is now like eight seconds. Right. Um, NPR and PBS allow a more uh, sustained discourse. And I think right. that's really good for the country, don't you? Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing I really enjoy is when they take an issue and they really go into it in detail and they bring experts in. And I think by and large, they try to get people from different points of view. Um, again, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm sorry that this person doesn't see that to be so, and it may be indicative of the fact that we're going to our respective corners. I think it's gotten better, actually, uh, rather than worse. You know, in, in early on, NPR was called Radio Free Nicaragua. Remember that era? <laughs> And, and it right. sort of then moved deliberately right. back towards the center right. to avoid right. being its budget cuts right. Right. by, by right. the Congress of the United and, States. And I think you're right. There, so there's an incentive structure there to bring them towards the center. Let's, Good incentive structure. Let's go to number 15. And we, we'll, more time for questioning coming. So this is interesting. Richard Hawes, you know his work, of course, his new book, The Bill of Obligations. He says this. How many of you can honestly say you live up to this? I, I was wringing my hands when I read it. An informed citizen is someone who understands the fundamentals as to how the government and the economy and society operate. The principal challenges facing the country at home and abroad 
and the contending options or policies for dealing with those challenges. It's pretty high standard, wouldn't it's you very, think? It's a very high standard. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of political science research shows us that most people are inattentive to politics. They've got more important things to do, and they, and they really do. I mean, they've got to attend to their job. They've got to attend to their children. They've got to attend to their uh, elderly parents. Uh, and so it makes sense that they would focus on those things and that politics would be down the list. Uh, that's why, though, we've got to find ways to get to them and have mechanisms whereby they can maybe learn about some of these kinds of things. You know, but the, but the, the country is so complex in its infrastructure and its economic systems right. and so on that the average citizen really isn't in a very good position to be fully aware of all these things. And that causes us to be reactive, isn't it? We react rather than evaluate. Yeah, that's true. Although uh, I've always said that people know what they need. Um, they have a good sense of what's important to them. They they may not know exactly, or maybe the better way, but they know what they want, and but they may not know exactly what they need. And that sounds a little paternalistic, but I think it's it's true that... People have wants and those wants need to be put forth. I think one of the problems we've had in the last 20 or 30 years is certain groups of the population haven't gotten a chance to make known their needs. Uh, this is various different parts of America and on the left and the right. Um, and But they know their wants and we've got to listen to those wants and we haven't been as attentive to that as we should have been. The needs gets at the question of, well, what will actually solve the problems that those wants represent? And that's where I think you get to a lot of the complexity. But I even think I've run things called deliberative polls. So deliberative poll is where you get a random sample of people from a given area. And we did it recently for California. And you bring them in, you have briefing books, you have experts, and you have them sit with their fellow representatives and people like them, and they discuss issues. And I think it's pretty remarkable what comes out of those events. People really are... First of all, they learn what others need, and, and that's important, uh, and they understand better what others' needs are, and that really makes a difference to them. Uh, they also, from the experts and from, actually, their fellow uh, people who are there, they learn a lot of what is possible, and as a result, they, in the end, often come to some very smart, I think, conclusions as a result of that. So I think there is room for doing better if we can find ways to bring people together. So there was a sort of a debate between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams in the early national period. And Adams believed that religion, it could be any number, it could be Methodism, it could be Lutheranism, it could be Catholicism, but religion was essential to the success of America because there needed to be a non-governmental source of legitimacy and restraint. And Jefferson's view was no. He was, of course, a student of the Scottish Enlightenment, that people have a moral sense and a secular society will be just fine. I remember in the 1950s when someone like Reinhold Niebuhr would be on the cover of Time or Martin Marty, and we looked up to the church as a very essential element in legitimacy and in our trust. And today that seems to have almost disappeared. Yeah, no, I think that's true. Um, I was a math physics undergraduate major, and I felt this is the late 60s that I had not gotten a good moral ethical background. So I went to a theological seminary for a year, Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Reinhold Niebuhr was there, indeed. And, although he was near the end of his life. Uh, and that was a really illuminating experience for me. And I, uh, part of the illumination was this, that I realized that religion, which had been very important to me as I was growing up, was no longer the leverage point for changing America, that it had become less relevant. And that's even increased more and more. We have more and more people who have no religious affiliation um, and as a result, I decided not to go on because it, the initial idea was that I would go on and become a minister. Uh, instead, I, I became an academic, uh, which is a form of ministry. Um, and uh, it really is. You get to mentor students. You get to be concerned about their lives. You get to help them. Um, to help undergraduates at Berkeley, where we have this extraordinary uh, set of people who uh, often come from low-income families, and to be able to advise them on how they can make their way in the world is, is a truly exciting thing. I taught at Harvard at one point, and I had a student who came to me and he said he couldn't do my final exam uh, because uh, he had a family event. And I said, what was the family event? And he said he had to go home to his father's coronation. And I realized at Harvard, I wasn't giving much value added. At Berkeley, I provide value added. Um, 
the guy, by the way, has gone on to be the king. And uh, he was about to become the prince, and now he's the king, or was the king. And anyway, um, so, yeah, religion just doesn't have the power it once has. And we need these normalizing, and by that I mean with norms, kinds of institutions. The other big problem is Bob Putnam's note of bowling alone, that all of these civic organizations are gone now, where people used to meet to bowl together or do whatever, but then talked about politics as well. Catherine Pearson's book, which is on Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, uh, also talks about this, how a lot of these institutions are gone. It used to be the place that brought people together, helped give them a moral center, and also helped them understand other people's needs. And as a result, allowed us to move forward as Americans together. So one way to look at that would be that there needs to be a source of ethical conversation and discourse in a thriving society. And it could be through religion. It could be through civic engagement, mm -hmm. like the New England right. town halls. It could be through heavy use of civics and ethics training in our school Which system. But it needs to be something. And at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any... Right. Um, sustained and and useful discourse about value, about ethics, about one's responsibilities in a community. No, I think that's right. And I think we need to find how we can reinvent those institutions. I mean, another piece of this is local journalism is going by the wayside. Uh, with the rise of the internet, um, they lost the classifieds to Craigslist. They lost advertising uh, to social media and so forth. And so now there's not a financial model for local media. And as a result, uh, we've lost about a third of our local newspapers in America, and we're still losing them. And the ones that we have retained are mostly, in fact, parts of large chains. They don't get local news. They get national news that's sort of uh, changed slightly to maybe have a local flavor. But that that's really a disaster for America because those local newspapers are the newspapers that actually help discipline local politicians, make sure they're not too corrupt, make sure that they're actually thinking of meeting the needs of the people and so forth. It is actually the case that those towns with local newspapers pay lower rates on their bonds. That is to say, they're better credit risks because they're less likely to have corruption, they're less likely to do stupid things. So we need local newspapers to discipline the public discourse. You might be, um... You might know this, but you're in a community that has a, a thriving daily print newspaper. Right, right. And that makes a difference. It makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. I mean, uh, unfortunately, college towns tend to have newspapers. Why? Because there's people who want to write for them and who have a lot of uh, writing ability and so forth. But that means that the towns that don't have these have newspapers tend to be towns without universities and maybe who have a lot of working class people, but who probably uh, need newspapers just as much, if not more. Okay, so we're talking about trust and we've seen the uh, the plummeting of trust in America. The military still stands pretty high, small business stands pretty high. Whom do we trust? What, what do we trust as a nation, as a people now, aside from those, those two instances? Yeah, I'm worried that sometimes we trust some of our politicians, which is, is very un-American, actually. Uh, um, because we we really, historically, remember, we started in a revolutionary moment not trusting the king. Um, and so we shouldn't trust politicians. That's why I'm not as worried about distrust of Congress or distrust of the presidency and so forth. Um, although I am of the Supreme Court, which I think is a, is a worry. Um, but... Uh, we just have to find a way to find other people to trust. And again, I, I'm, I'll talk some about this, about how institutions have to become trustworthy. Higher education, the one I'm most cl clearly affiliated with, has to get better at making the case of why we do good things. I think we do good things by and large, but we make mistakes, But we and we have to clean those up, and we have to also just make the case as to why we are to be trusted. Well, the, per higher ed, and I want you to go through your 10 before we go back to the audience, but per higher ed, it's not just these uh, scandals in the presidencies and so right. on. The rights perception that that you send your children off to university and, and they learn how to hate America, right. the left-leaning nature of faculties and student bodies, that universities are 
are politicized and ideological to in a way that that thwarts their enlightenment purpose. Surely that's something you think about at UCAL yeah. Berkeley. I mean, part of what we're doing is making people skeptical. And if you live in a community that has answers to questions uh, based upon your ideological perspective, you're not going to like what a university does if a university is doing its job. So I don't, people have to understand that's what we do. Uh, and so we make people question. And that might mean that the person who comes who's highly religious ends up coming out not so highly religious. Um, and that's just because they became more skeptical and, and thought about it harder. Or the reverse could occur as well. So um, that's part of our job. Uh, on the other hand, we're not doing such a good job always right now in making sure that it's a place where everybody can feel like they can put forth their views and discuss issues and so on and so forth. Uh, and and that's, that's a worry to me. It's a worry to many people. I was looking at the ratings actually of free speech and Berkeley is in the middle of the pack basically right now, which is not bad. Um, I was shocked to see that Harvard is actually zero on the ratings I was looking at, which is not good by the way. Um, and so there are people certainly doing worse than us, but we need to do better. I mean, to give you an example, Milo Yiannopoulos, who um, is a prankster, really. I mean, he's not a serious person. Uh, he's, he's a right wing. He's a right wing activist and and loves to just uh, um, pull the tail of different institutions. And he was pulling our tail. He actually announced he was going to have a a right a one week free speech week. He claimed he was going to have all these speakers come in. We actually started getting uh, calls from the speakers he claimed were coming in that he'd never contacted those people and that they weren't coming and they didn't know what this was all about. So clearly he'd made this all up. Nevertheless, we literally spent millions of dollars so that he could come speak uh, and have police protection and have a crowd there and so on and so forth. So I think that's a pretty strong commitment to free speech when we allow essentially a prankster to come in and cost us millions of dollars, which by the way, we could have used for financial aid for students and things like that. So it's extremely painful. So we're trying hard. I'm not sure that story always gets out. And we're living through a, a real flashpoint here with Gaza and yes. Israel. I mean, it's it's rocked the academic world. Right, it really has. Um, and here we're again, we're trying very hard at Berkeley. We're trying to have different perspectives come in, and uh, but we've had problems. We recently had an incident where we had a speaker uh, from Israel who was coming in, speaking uh, mostly to Jewish students, but not entirely. And so we moved the event once to make sure that this person was protected. But even to the place we moved the event, uh, the protesters started breaking windows, and so we had to cancel the event. Um, but we tried. And again, and that probably, I don't know how much that cost us, but my guess is half a million dollars probably in police that night. To make a safe enlightenment space to, for to all this To do the discourse. best we could do. And so these are not easy issues when you have people who are willing to be violent. And many of us are really disturbed, actually, about the degree to which there are some people, I'm not sure they're always students, um, who are willing to create such a mess uh, and perpetrate at least property damage, if not other kinds of violence, uh, to stop an event like that. I think a university is a place where all sorts of perspectives uh, should have a chance uh, to be aired. Uh, that's what we're about. And Voltaire, that, madam, I disagree with what you say, but I shall defend to the death your right, right to say it. Exactly. Almost the mission statement of the university. Right. Before we go to your 10 points, uh, which we need to do, um, I want to just ask you to weigh all of this. Okay, loss of, of respect and trust uh, it could be healthy skepticism, which is part of the American character. It could be greater transparency. We know mm -hmm. more than we ever knew before. It could be the exacerbation of social media. How serious is this crisis? Is it worth thinking about, but we shouldn't let our hair get on fire? Is this um, uh, possibly terminal to the future of the American Republic? Where do you put it in your scale of concerns about the future? I think it's a serious concern. I just see a lot of institutions which are dissolving in some ways and not having the power to solve problems that they once had. And I don't know how to recover those institutions. It's very easy to destroy trust. It's really hard to create trust. Uh, as a dean for 12 years, I saw how hard it was to create trust and how much I had to work at that and how the slightest thing could knock that off course. 
And unfortunately, we're just getting a lot of things now which are knocking it off course. So I'm really worried about it. I, I think it's a, a big worry. And I think we need to invest a lot of time and effort into putting ourselves back on the right track. Is it existential or is it just grave? Could be darn. It's grave. Let's put it there. So cheer us up. Sure. <laughs> there are things to, we could do. Okay. First, I think we have to fix some of the causes. Um, inequality in America, I think, is one of the causes that's created uh, problems. The working class in America until recently has not really uh, been increasing in real terms their incomes. And we have to find a way to, to deal with the fact that we've got one of the areas with a tremendous wealth being created. If you look at Wikipedia, by the way, at uh, all of the uh, biggest houses in America, you'll find they were built in two periods. One was the Gilded Age in the late 19th century, and the other era was now. So there is a lot of wealth out there to build. Frankly, I'm not sure why you need a. a, 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 a I don't want to. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to offend anybody. But you know, read your audience. I'll 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 read my audience. But I think you should ask yourself. Um. um I said, cheer us up. Okay. Um, uh, immigration and borders. We have just let that get completely out of hand, and we've got to deal with that. Both parties. Yes, both parties. I mean, and there's there's no question that we just have not solved the problem. We've let it just get worse and worse and worse without an ability to get together. But it's a solvable problem. It's a solvable, I think, mostly solvable problem, although a lot of it has to do with things going on in South America and the rest of the world, by the way, that are going to get worse, I think, as we have climate change, and people are going to find that they just have to come somewhere where they feel safe, and uh, America is going to look like a great beacon and so and, they're going to be willing, too. yeah, and they're going to be willing to make a journey to come here. So we got to deal with that. The other, third thing is technological change. We've just got to get some handle on. Uh, I think again that we didn't do a good job of regulating social media. I think we have to think long and hard about AI. I'm worried that the tech companies are so powerful that they're not going to allow us to regulate social uh, uh, AI. But I mean, if you think about it, they're using our information and. We don't own it. And you could think there's a different model you could even come up with, which would be, this is a public utility. And because our information is our information, maybe we have some rights to it and we have to find ways to regulate it with that approach in mind. We're really far from that notion right now. So your idea is that, that we need to have thoughtful regulation right. of media right. in order to prevent it from spinning too far out of control. Absolutely. And do you think, I know Congress makes a run at this from time to time. Do you think they're doing an adequate job? No. Con in fact, part of the problem is Congress is woefully ill-prepared to regulate uh, uh, tech because they just, by and large, just don't know enough about it. And have and the one institution they used to have, a thing called the Office of Technology Assessment, uh, was destroyed in 1994. It had been there for about uh, since about what 1973 or four, something like that. Well, that's the Gingrich Revolution. Yeah, well, I didn't want to say who it was, but it was yes, it was the Gingrich Revolution, and they got rid of the Office of Technology Assessment, which would have given the Congress a much better uh, grip on a lot of these complicated technological issues. Um, so I'm still in just fixing the causes. Uh, I'm just going to mention this one. Long-term debt, I think, is a big problem for America. We've got to think about, and we got to come to grips with xenophobia and racism in America. Uh, we have not solved that problem. We've made real progress. I remember what it was like in the 1950s uh, to go through the South. And no question, we've made enormous progress. And we were to be congratulated for that. But we haven't solved the problems fundamentally. But you know, I mean, I'm not wanting to be critical, but you're not cheering us up. You're, you're saying these are things we could address. Well, we, but, but some of them are fixable. Like, I think we could fix tech. Uh, I mean, I think if we really got some smart people and we're willing to think about regulating it, we could come up with better ways of doing it. But there has to be the will to do it. It has to be the will to do it. That's true. But what's interesting here, there is a left-right coalition here. I mean, there's people like Josh Hawley is one of the people who's very much into let's regulate tech. And so it's not just people on the left who want to regulate tech. It's so it goes back to what you said earlier. We need, to, we need to make possible compromise right. and a centrist right. politics. There's, there's, I think, places we could meet in the middle. So that's fixed some of the causes. SEC has changed incentives for politicians. I've talked about the top two primary. I've talked about multi-member districts. Um, I think we have to do more of that and think about how to fix our democracy so we're giving politicians better uh, incentives. Third, campaign finance and money in politics. 
I said I'd like to see a constitutional amendment. That's probably not going to happen. But at least we could find ways to have better regulation of super PACs and have more transparency so we know where that money's coming from. Uh, we also could think about finance schemes like the Seattle voucher experiment, where everybody's given $10, $20 uh, as a voucher that they can then give to the candidate of their choice, and that would bring the public into campaign finance. Um, we've got to improve the performance of government, uh, and we've got people at Berkeley working really hard to work with the state of California to improve their use of data science, for example. I think there's a real opportunity now uh, to really make government work better using data science kinds of methods, and so we've got to do that. Um, we've got to have institutions consider their cultural and ethical responsibilities. We were talking about that with respect to higher education. I think every institution needs to stop and think, what are my responsibilities here? And make sure that they're really discharging those responsibilities. Um, we've got to rebuild local media. I've talked about that. My solution would be to tax social media, set up a fund and find, and this is a difficult problem, find some way that there would be an arm's length relationship between the tax money coming in and the distribution of that money to the local media so that we wouldn't have government control of those media. Uh, but that's at least maybe one idea of how to do that. Um, we've got to regulate social media and, AT, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. I've already talked about that. I actually think there are good ideas out there about how we could do that and we could do much better at it. Civic education is one of the most important things we can do. We just have students who are getting either no civic education or bad civic education. Good civic education would be how to figure out if something's true, how to understand that if you're gonna get something done, compromise is gonna be necessary and compromise isn't a dirty word and working with others is okay. In fact, it's great. And so we've gotta have better ways of teaching civics and make sure that it focuses on the process of making civilization work and not just you know, the facts about uh, the constitution or the three branches of government. Um, we've got to get people together. Uh, I'm a big believer in national service. I'd love to see national service. I think it would bring all sorts of different people together in a way that would be life-changing. My brother, my twin brother, went into the Peace Corps. It changed his life fundamentally. Uh, and I saw what it did for him. I think it could do that for many, many other people. And of course, we could have a very broad definition of national service. Yes. Yes. And then finally, the American creed and getting up to the, the 250th anniversary of America, I think we have to start remembering what the American creed is. Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and I would say Statue of Liberty. And we have to put those things together and understand that's what we're about. And we are an unusual place in that we have a civic ideology. Uh, we believe in America as an idea. It's not that we believe in being a German or a member of French civilization. We believe in America as this democratic ideal where there's opportunity for all and a chance to make something of yourself starting from nothing. That's something we really just need to emphasize. And I think this is an opportune moment to do that. No, the, the 250th. Yes. So a friend of mine um, I just interviewed who's Dutch, a uh, very distinguished Dutch journalist has spent a lot of time in America. And I asked him uh, if he could to speak a little bit about how Europe is looking at us now. And, and it was heartbreaking. He said, we're just so sad. We're sad to see America in this fix right. because it's not just America. The world looks to America. We really were or should be the shining city on the hill. We were best practices. We were the ideals that the world was moving towards. You remember when the wall came down and uh, Francis Fukuyama said it's the end of history. And there was right. this sense that all problems had been solved. I know it was yeah. foolish, but but you know the idea that Europe is now looking yeah. and, and wondering what happens when America ceases to live according right. to, or to try to live according right. to its loudly proclaimed ideals. Yeah, I mean, the sad thing is the mess at the border has led us to maybe take our eye off the fact that we are a country of immigrants and how important that is. And that it's what makes this an extraordinary place. Uh, and that we have to reaffirm how important that is to us as a nation and that we're willing to deal with people from different places with different races and creeds and so on and so forth, because that's what America is truly about. So before we turn back uh, to questions, both from our people streaming and from the audience here, 
where's where are the best arenas where these sorts of reforms are happening? My sense is it's not at the top. It's mm -hmm. it's, it's local. It's well, all over the country, and great things are being done in this community or that. And we need to stop fixating on the national solutions and look instead to the unbelievable diversity of options right. in the country. No, I think that's right. And there's a lot of groups that have started to try to figure out how ways to bring people together or how to think about multi-member districts and what that would look like or uh, how to have deliberative polls that would be uh, in many different local areas so people could get together and discuss their local needs and so forth. And I think a lot of local governments, which are, by the way, more trusted than state governments, which are more trusted than the national government. So local governments tend to be more trusted because they're low, uh, closer to us and we just feel that they are better. So just one last thing. So you freely admitted at the beginning that you're a liberal Democrat. Right. If you were a, 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 a deep conservative and you were here from an, maybe from Berkeley, I'm right. unclear, but from another institution, uh, you may have said what we need is uh, is prayer. What we in schools, what we need is uh, to dis to make heavy incentives for uh, intact families. Mm -hmm. um, you know th that we need uh, national service in in a, in a much more emphatic way. In other words, somebody from an opposite political persuasion, having had this discussion about loss of trust, would have a different set of options, right? They, they might. Uh, although I, I actually think I'm a Berkey and conservative as well as being a liberal Democrat. Uh, I, you know, I really believe in the importance of institutions. I don't think institutions. Uh, are easy to build. I think they're incredibly hard to build. I'm so proud of the University of California and what we've built. Uh, we, for example, in the last 15 years, we've added about 12,000 students to Berkeley, which is two Stanfords. Two Stanfords. We've added two Stanfords to Berkeley. And that's amazing. We're a public university. And we, by the way, do it at about a third the cost of Stanford. About a third the cost. I have no idea what the privates do with their money. I really do not, because we managed to do it so much more cheaply and just about as well. How many students at Berkeley now? Uh, about 42,000. That's not the biggest, but it's up there. It's, and we're going to keep getting bigger, I'm sure. So, uh, you know, there there are, I'm a Berkeley conservative. I believe in institutions, and we've got to make sure we nurture these institutions. And we can't believe that somehow destroying institutions is going to lead to something better on the other side. It's just not. That, in fact, if you don't like institutions, go look at Afghanistan, okay? You'll find that's perfect place. Hey, no institutions. Wow, what a wonderful place. Let's go to some questions. So James and Megan, Megan, do you have another one from our stream? I do. Isn't skepticism and cynicism a historical indicator of social upheaval? Harkening back to the time of the Greeks, after the Peloponnesian Wars or after the Enlightenment period, if distress is a harbinger of change, how should institutions deal with that? Wow. <laughs> You're the humanist. <laughs> well, when I look at all this, I mean, I, I know that there has always been populism and demagoguery and opportunism in politics that goes all the way back to Pericles mm -hmm. and so on. But it does seem to me that our leaders, and I don't just mean from on the on the right, across the board, have failed to realize that they have a deep responsibility to make the case for America, right. to, to say that whatever the problems of the FBI are, we need an FBI, that whatever the problems of, of this or that institution, these are things that are the essential glues of a society. And you're not hearing a lot of it on the extremes of either party now. There's a there's a way in which it's in their to their advantage to denigrate those essential institutions. And I think that's a, a profound failure of leadership. Yeah. And when we have great leaders, um, either those uh, who, who produce great results as Lyndon Johnson did during the 60s, or say somebody like um, Pericles in ancient Athens, they sing the song of those societies. They say, we are this people. And you don't hear that a lot these days, that, that kind of Jeffersonian aspirational Right. That we're all in this together, that we must solve problems together, that that these institutions are not to be lightly toyed with. I think our leaders have really betrayed us on both sides of the spectrum. Yeah, and do that in a way that, I mean, for example, on the left, it's hard to talk about the glories of capitalism. And yet, wow. I mean, if you'd ever been in the Soviet Union and I spent time in the Soviet Union, that didn't work so well, guys. Um, it was, I, I love to tell the story of the 
of the of the grocery stores with 200 items. You had uh, uh, rancid meat and you had uh, moldy vegetables. Uh, look, go into the average American grocery store and recognize that as a triumph of American civilization. Okay, sure, yeah, some of us may be overly processed food and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, there's problems. But if wait, it's still just amazing to walk into an American grocery store. And I can tell you how amazing it is because I've during the 1990s, I brought some people from the Soviet Union to California and made the mistake of taking them to a grocery store. And it basically almost completely freaked them out. They had never seen anything that was so glorious in their life. And they couldn't believe what had been produced. And that's an everyday aspect of America that we don't celebrate enough. It's amazing. Trade shows are another thing I make the case for. Trade shows, that's the mechanism by which we make sure that the needs of the people out there are met by the manufacturers of the products. Soviet central planning didn't do that so well. They didn't have trade shows. James. Okay, before I come around, I just wanna celebrate our local paper. This is the Vale Daily. Hey, this hey is ho, the, hey ho. The article about this week, uh, tonight's program and tomorrow night's program on the 10 greatest photographs of all time. I can plug it now and I won't have to do it later. And we can pull the newspaper thread. We're so lucky in our little community to have such a great local paper. Okay. Questions, yeah. raise your hand and we'll get to as many as we can. Megan, do you have more? Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. It's been a great evening. Um, Professor Brady, um, you, we know we started about talking about polarization and trust, and, and it seemed like uh, it was a passive devolution. And I look at it as more deliberate attempt by a lot of people. You know, I look at a through line between Rush Limbaugh and the Tea Party and Steve Bannon's vow to tear down the administrative state. And I feel like our desire, our noble desire to restore trust is not being is being met with resistance. And I want to wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah, I'd say yes. I don't want to really we're trying to avoid the T word. Um so the, the Rush, the Rush Limbaugh, I know, but Rush Limbaugh is sort of a, a proxy. Uh and uh and uh yeah, no, I mean I think that's been part of the problem. Um the left has some of these problems too. The sometimes I don't think they do a good enough job. The 1619 project, which in many ways I I've said to people, hey, look. It was time that we had maybe the story told from a different perspective. And so the 1619 Project is not the end of the world. It, it, it may be not perfect history at, at every moment, but it's it's worth reading and trying to understand what things look like from that perspective. Um, so, But it also, unfortunately, does not necessarily celebrate the glories of America. It really tells you a lot of the problems we've had. We should, of course, we should, we must take those problems into account because we've we acted very badly in much. I mean, the original sin of this country is slavery, and we ignored it in the Constitutional Convention. Uh, basically, by the way, because some of the members of the Constitutional Convention argued it's going to go away, slavery is going to go away. They did not anticipate the cotton gin. They did not anticipate then what happened in the next fifty years in the South. And also, of course, the second original sin, the di the dispossession of Native peoples. And then Native the peoples. It's the story in Cal. You should go read. The first governor, governor of California's a statement about how to deal with the uh, Native Americans. Basically, we it's a shame we're going to have to exterminate them. They're in our way. They're a problem. We got to get rid of them. There were government it's, government bounties to kill a Native American. Unbelievable. I mean, this was what the government of California was proposing and did. But you know, the question that that Megan was reporting from one of the people who, listening on streaming that in in times of enormous social change that there's also there is often a sort of a disruption think of the french revolution for example mm -hmm. and that disruption yes. may be a good thing in certain cases mm -hmm. and it may be a necessary evil to get you through paralysis to something else and there's a widespread feeling that our system is broken right and someone like i'm not going to defend steve bannon but i'm going to say that his nihilism is break it all down because it right. just isn't working right is part of what happens when societies are going through very rapid change and there's uneasiness across the land, right? So yeah, no. it's not necessarily the worst thing that could happen, but how you apply it. Right. I mean, I think I, I've always said that if more people in Silicon Valley had read about the French Revolution, they might have understood that it's not necessarily the case that they, we would come out on the other side of 
uh, social media a better nation, that we might actually have problems uh, and that we might have a period like we did during uh, the French Revolution where things didn't go so well for quite a while, uh, leading to Napoleon, of course. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. So disruption. <laughs> We're in a period of disruption. And yeah. some of our political right. candidates have said, I'm here to disrupt. Right. And many people, reasonable people, think, you know, the system needs be, to be disrupted. Right. And I think the system does need to be disrupted. But, you know, it's got to be done in a way where we recognize what the strengths are of this nation as well. And again, that we have some respect for institutions. We just can't tear them all down. Um, you know, the defund the police um, on the left was, was just a foolish notion. I mean, it, it came from folks who... I think had good intentions and there's no question that the police have acted horribly in some circumstances and need to be reformed. But on the other hand, you go to the average minority community and ask them, do they want to really get rid of the police? And the answer is no. And you see that in Oakland, by the way, right now, that initially the impulse was to try to maybe reduce policing in Oakland. And now they're going in exactly the opposite direction. Well, but try hopefully better policing. And I, as I mentioned earlier, we have people at Berkeley working with Oakland to see if we can't do it better. Well, you know, to take just a moment to defund the police, it's more complicated than that sounds what was being attempted there. But right. what a ham handed slogan, you know, way to lose much of the country in a single slogan. Well, my students wanted me to write a letter saying that we should get rid of the UC Berkeley police. Now, the UC Berkeley police <laughs> uh, do things like, uh, late at night, when there's uh, somebody who feels unsafe, they walk them from one place to another. Okay, and I wrote, I wrote back to my students, I'm not going to do that. I want you to be safe. If we have problems with UC Berkeley police, and we and we did, uh, well, let's fix them, but let's not just get rid of it. Hard to imagine Berkeley without some control of the students. I mean, <laughs> whoa, that could be quite. By the way, a there's there's more ideological diversity at Berkeley than you might. Uh, uh, imagine we have John Yu there, for example. Yes, of course. Um, and when, in fact, when anybody says to me, Berkeley's just not uh, ideologically diverse, I say, Well, John Yu. Yes, it rhymes with something. <laughs> Megan? <laughs> to what extent does inadequacy of education play into the problem of trust and propensity to believe disinformation? Right. We had one slide about the, the failure of the Jeffersonian. Ideal. Jefferson right. said, this only works if you have a very well-educated right. people. And I don't right. think anyone would say at the moment that of the 340 million Americans that we have a very well-educated people. Yeah, although it's better educated than it was 50 years ago. So, um, you know, part of this problem has to be that universities aren't doing a good enough job with civics education and things like that. So we need to do better. Um, I don't think we're going to ever get to the point where Everybody is so well-educated that they know all the details of public policy. But I hope we can find ways to bring them into organizations and groups so that they feel a little bit of trust and feel that they have groups that represent them and that are making the case for their needs so, or, or for their wants so that we can figure out how to address those needs. Um, what do you think is bigger imperative, that the people show some trust or that the institutions earn some trust? I, I probably earn. It's got to start by earning institutions have to, and we have too many institutions which frankly have fallen down. Um, I remember my aunt, a longtime Catholic, and I, me asking her, well, what's going on with your local church? And she said, I'm not a Catholic anymore. I'm not a member of a church that allows pedophiles to run rampant. And it broke my heart. She'd spent a, a lifetime getting surcease from sorrow from the Catholic church. And now suddenly she just had to reject it. Well, that, that says something about the church not about her. Um, I wanted to go back to local institutions for a second, because it seems very significant to me that um, as we get more local, our trust in those institutions increase. And I worry that we expend a lot of our political energy on national politics. And I, I guess I wonder if, um, uh, if that's kind of, part of the problem. It's the reason why we need more local media, because they help focus our attention on local politics and give us the wherewithal, the knowledge, the information, so that we can actually be learned and knowledgeable about those local politics. Um, and, and it also just is a, 
a way to glue people together because you go and you look for what your friends mentioned, uh, what happened with the basketball team, what happened with this and the other thing. So we really need those local media. They're the important glue for America that unfortunately is going away. Uh, and by the way, political scientists have noted uh, with alarm uh, that increasingly local politics seems to revolve around national issues in bizarre ways, like local politics revolving around abortion. Well, abortion is really not ultimately a local issue. It's a national issue. It's going to be decided by the Supreme Court or a state issue, but it's probably not a, a local issue. But that's what's been happening is the nationalization of local politics. It's not a good thing. And it's partly because we're losing local media. Other questions and comments? Raise your hand. A couple over here. We have maybe more from the streaming, but two here, James. Um, yes, you mentioned earlier that you would make a comment about um, the eroding of trust and climate change. Could you speak to that in the sense of uh, how you see that affecting the health of the planet, the health of our communities? You would have thought that trust in science was a no-brainer, but yeah. it isn't, right? Yeah, no, and, and obviously we've got to do a better job in this, but let me tell you a story which is sort of fun, uh, which is the there was a professor at Berkeley, uh, Richard Muller, uh, Mueller, uh, who was a physicist, a very noted physicist, and he was a climate skeptic. He had a good reason to be. He had a theory about why maybe uh, our notions about climate changing was artifactual. I won't get into the details, but it was a good theory. And he got money from the Koch brothers to do a study. He did his study. He brought together a whole bunch of people from the Berkeley campus. They looked and looked and looked and found out that his theory was partly right, but mostly just wrong. And that in the fact, in the end, they wrote a report that said, guess what? Climate change is real. It's really happening. And furthermore, the only correlate we can see that makes any sense to explain what's going on is greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, that's an example. That's good science. Where with good science, I think. And it's, it's science doing what it should do. Thinking about reasons why you might be wrong and trying to figure out if you are wrong. And, but again, we've got to get to Americans and explain to them that there really are scientists out there who are trying to prove that climate change is wrong, who are doing it in a way that makes sense, but they can't find any evidence that it is wrong. And that maybe should make you believe it's real. But Professor Brady, I mean, and I don't mean to, I don't want to demonize the Koch brothers, but they weren't saying just do good science. They were funding what they hoped would show yes. that climate change is From a hoax. Berkeley, no less. Wouldn't that be great? That would show that those climate change folks were just full of it. Um, yeah, no, and they were. But the fact is, they scientists did what they should do, which is they tried to search for the truth. And and I think uh, I've read the report because again, I've got background in statistics, and and it's really well done, and it's. Uh, very thoughtful and it makes a good point and it also ends up with conclusion that unfortunately is the one that's so devastating and worrisome to all of us they probably didn't get a follow-up grant from the Koch brothers i don't think so i don't think but so. that really although the Koch brothers i mean give them their due and i don't want to get into the tea area but they did support nikki haley and i was very happy to see that kind of thing and to see a candidate on the Republican side, I'm making no comments about other candidates, but one that seemed to me to be sort of standard issue, knowledgeable about politics, having been at the UN, having been a governor, uh, talking about the facts and actually trying to persuade people that her ideas were good ideas. But I don't want to characterize Berkeley or the California system, but in a number of states, the legislatures have starved their universities, so they look for funding from the outside. Those funds often come with strings attached, right. often ideological strings. Right. Well, this is a problem we have. I mean, Berkeley is down to just 12% funding from the state. We're more state located now than we are state funded. Uh, and that's a tremendous change from 50 years ago when we were about 70% state funded. That's happened to almost all American higher education institutions. The reason is, is we're the balance wheel. Every time a state has a budgetary problem, they decide to cut higher education funding. Why? because we actually have the capacity to tax. That capacity to tax is called tuition. And then, by the way, and this is great for legislatures, they can then complain, that university increased their tuition. 
How outrageous. Can you believe they did that? And of course, why did they increase the tuition? Because the legislature cut their funding. And in fact, today, we get less in terms of total funds from tuition plus the legislature than we used to get 50 years ago per student. So in other words, in real terms, this is adjusted for inflation. So we are actually making do with less in the way of resources than we had 50 years ago. So it is true we've increased our tuition and people complain about public higher educational institutions doing that. But the truth is we've done it because the legislatures have cut our funding and we then got, complained about it. We've got seven minutes here and I, and I want to make sure that everyone is aware that you can get this book and I think you would be willing to sign it. It's a very interesting and important study that you helped, uh, that you were the co-editor of. And so that's one thing. Right. Um, so, and James, I know you'll want to say a closing word, but Megan, you probably have one or two more questions. Yes, we have a final two questions from online audience. And thanks, um, online audience. This is what we seek. Yeah, yeah. This is a, yes, from our 50 attendees, there's a lot of questions. So thank you for bearing with our questions. Could you comment on the role that patriarchy is playing in everything that is taking place? Religion, politics, ethics, community, the recent legislative attacks on women. The issue of patriarchy. Patriarchy. I mean, this is a look a, at the time, you know. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is first another question. My wife remaining. up here to talk about it because she would speak more knowledgeably and thoughtfully. But um, it's a terrible problem. And one of the concerns about white Christian evangelicals is they've been struggling with the question of sex and the role of men, and they've actually come to what I think is a rather toxic version of what men should be within uh, a religious uh, venue, uh, that men should be, well, I'm gonna use the T word. They actually, well, let me not use the T word. Let me use the John Wayne word, that men should be like John Wayne. Uh, and John Wayne was not the most admirable character. He had several marriages, he had extramarital affairs, he was arguably a racist and so forth. But the focus on the patriarchy and the ostensible importance of the patriarchy to the Christian religion, which personally as a former seminary student, I think is wrong, uh, has led them to what I think is a pretty toxic view of what men should be and led them to endorse people like John Wayne. Yeah, so, so, so Josh Hawley, a senator from Missouri, has yeah. a book called Manhood in which he argues that men need right. to dominate, that that's the right. Pauline paradigm that makes America work. And he's a very highly educated right. man. So there is this perspective. My father spent six years island hopping in the Pacific in World War II. He was a manly man. There's no question about it. I have tremendous respect for him. He was also a thoroughly decent, caring person who thought his wife was, uh, and he was right, smarter than him and, <laughs> and, 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 and respected women and taught me that that was the most fundamental and important thing. And that Patriarchy was not something in his lexicon. Let's do one more. Humans tend to pay attention to and remember those things that are negative and or what is going wrong. Our focus on the negative is trust eroding, not trust forming. Will there be room in our society to focus on positive outcomes and what is going right? Will this help build trust and allow for a cultural shift? So here's your list. Yeah, I, I think there's ways to build trust. And I just think we have to put some effort into it. And again, just to take one example, local news. There are ways we could support local news and make sure we have local newspapers. I think that will help build trust in communities. And it's a very, very important thing to do. So let me ask you this sort of exit question. You have a, an amazingly distinguished career, many books, uh, important books, uh, you've won awards, you know, you've been honored by your faculty uh, and students. Um, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I'd say you're in at least the seventh inning of your career. <laughs> um, so you've had a long time yeah. at, at some of the greatest institutions in America. Do you now look at America with your own disillusionment? Or what's, what's your level of sadness, pessimism about where we are, or optimism and hope about where we are? I'm the son of a carpet salesman. My father did not go to college. Uh, I supported my parents when I was in graduate school because my father had lost his job. But America has given me opportunities that I could have never imagined. Uh, 
I think this is an extraordinary country. I have tremendous hope for America. Um, and I feel so lucky. I have been blessed with every advantage my father didn't get. I got it. He had the Depression. He had World War II. Um, he had, unfortunately, a, an industry, the carpet industry, that went south because of the invention of tufting and and uh, and uh, artificial fibers. And I can tell you that story. It's a fascinating story. Um, and I didn't have any of those disadvantages. I had every single advantage you can imagine. And I want other Americans to have that advantage. I want us to remember who we are, what we are, what we can be, and what we can do. And I think... That's the challenge before us. So you're saying, it sounds like a little clunky now, but you're an embodiment of the American dream. I feel really lucky. Yes, I do. I think, you know, I worked in a factory at one point. Uh, there's not, unfortunately, enough academics who worked in a factory, but I did. And I know what that's like. Um, and so, yeah, I want more of us to get the opportunities to have the chances that I had. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Henry Brady. And Clay Jenkinson. Uh, as, as we close, um, I'll, I'll just will highlight because Clay won't do it. Um, this is one of Clay's titles, Repairing Jefferson's America, A Guide to Civility and Enlightened Citizenship. Uh, it's well worn on my bookshelf and you'll find it at the bookworm uh, in Edwards. Um, I'm, I know that there are more questions here and you're welcome to chat with Clay and Henry. We'll take Clay off into the side chapel and turn the lights on. We'll bring Henry back to that table and he's happy to sign copies of the Daedalus book. Um, those are complimentary and they are first come first serve. There is an online version and I'll send an email out with that link. So if you prefer digital, you'll get that shortly. Um, but please give them both a chance to get off the high rise and safely onto solid ground. Uh, before you mob them with your questions. And uh, and very, very sincerely from our small team at the Vail Symposium, thank you, not just for spending your evening with us, but for cranking your gears on a really important topic. Good night, everyone. <laughs>